God, we want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're with us. God, I thank you that your word is powerful. It's active. It can cut through anything. And so this morning, we just surrender ourselves to you, God. God, I pray that you speak this morning. God, we're ready. We're keen. And I thank you that you're enlarging our hearts for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to share a quick message this morning around something that, um, you know, I'm a bit of a... um, I'm a bit of a strange one. I'll have lots of random little thoughts all the time. I feel like squirrel. If I was an animal, I'd be a squirrel, right? I'm like thinking, thinking, thinking. And so when I come to do a message, I really struggle because I'm like, oh, I've got lots of good options, but I just, I, I don't know which one to put legs on. <laughs> so this message comes out of a few different thoughts. So thanks for praying. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk this morning around culture. And cultures establish when a group of people come together, um, they're headed in the same direction and are on the same page. Now, who's, who's in a workplace? You know that culture's really important, isn't it? Culture can make or break that workplace. And Ronald Kenner, I don't know who this is, but he's a, he's a cool guy. He says this. <laughs> he says, The strongest force in an organisation is not vision or strategy, It is the culture which holds all other components. I like food, so I was trying to work of a way that I could deliver that to you as a food analogy. (laughs) So if a good steak is the vision, then the plate in which it's served on is the culture. Is that helpful? So if the plate is dirty... And there's a really good looking bit of steak on it. Ah, it, It's kind of like the steak or the vision, if you like, is then a bit confused. It's a bit tainted. You're welcome, Sharon Jones. That's my prop, guys. So if a good steak is the vision, then the plate on which it's served is the culture. Now, I want us to think specifically today around church culture. And so that's what we do. That's who we are. It's uh, the values that we hold. It's the beliefs that we have. It's the collective attitude that that we have. It's our collective habits. It's what we allow to be the norm. It's the tone. So it's what you feel and experience, yes? Right, everyone's tracking. Awesome. So the purpose around sharing this today is that we would collectively be on the same page, that we would collectively be heading in the same direction together. You know, unity is just a weapon. And as a church, we need to be unified. And so today, I hope that we can all uh, grab a hold of this delicious steak together. But more than that, I, I pray that we would value the plate in which it's served on together. And as we build and establish, you know, it's important to know, okay, the foundation of culture is core values. So if you're in a workplace, you know, you'll hear these terms all the time. But I want you to think specifically about church, but also personally. So whether it's your personal life, your family, workplace, the culture's established on the foundation of core values. So these are the things that we stand on no matter what. And because of those core values, some, de- some decisions, sorry, will be automatically made for us. For example, I, I made a decision to, to be with Luke, to marry Luke. So my core value is that I'm committed to him. So the, the pre, uh, some of the decisions that are now taken off the plate for me is that I don't actually get to look around for a better offer. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I know, you're a good looking rooster. Yes, it's true. But my core values mean that some of my decisions are predetermined. And so as the eagle family, you know, we got married, yes, and then we went on to have four little eagles. Bless them. And so we have some core values as a family. And who's got core values as a family that they kind of, yeah, that they, you might have it written down, you might have it up. I think it's really powerful for our kids to see that because we want 
um, you know, those core values to shape them, don't we? And so we've got a few core values. Does anyone want to share any of their core values that they have as a family? Just shout them out. Luke, take notes. Does anybody want to shout them out? Anybody feeling brave? Honesty. Kindness. Yes. Respect. 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 Honesty. Honesty. Abok, what did you say? Love each other. So nice to see you, Abok. Thankful of our word. Thankfulness. We're people of our word. Beautiful core value. What was that, sorry? Accountability. Accountability. Beautiful. Awesome. These are fabulous core values. And I think what's really powerful is that when we are teaching um, our kids these things, um, you know, we're actually helping them to become really healthy adults, hopefully one day. <laughs> it's a long-term game, isn't it? It's not just like we, we put these things up on the wall and then tomorrow they're all doing it. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen. I wish it did. <laughs> but it's a long-term game. Yay! And so as a culture, as a family, sorry, you have a culture. And so some of our cultures as a church is that we are generous. So, yes, that's our name, but also, hopefully, that's our nature. That's who we are. We, I think Amy shared it this morning in our volunteers meeting, one of our core values is that no one stands alone. So we actually take notice when people are alone and we, we go and we, we make them feel welcome or we might introduce them to somebody else. And we all play a part in that. You know, one of the things, one of the... the Changing messages for my life was when Pastor Ben shared a few years ago around we dig wells, we don't build fences. That has changed my life, Ben. We make room at the table. That's our core value. We value the five-fold ministry and we're certainly moving towards that. And so all of these core values serve our vision and our vision is community, mission, discipleship, that we would be people that... Um, are growing in our faith, we're growing in our community here, we're living on mission, we're sharing the hope of Jesus wherever we are and that we're all committed to growing through the discipleship process. And I want to share a quick story from the, the life of Moses this morning. I'm going Old Testament, guys. I don't often do that, mostly because I feel like I don't have enough knowledge. So be kind to me after. Actually, don't email me. Just <laughs> encourage me, please. Um, <laughs> the thing I love about Moses is that he had a fundamental concern with knowing God's ways that he might know God himself. And we're going to look at um, Exodus 33. So if you've got your Bibles, please grab them out. If you've got a notepad, please grab them out. And we read a lot in the Old Testament about the presence of God. And so I, I went on a little hunt here to see, okay, what did that actually mean? And the common Hebrew term for presence is panim, which means, which is translated to mean face, implying a close or a personal encounter with the Lord. So when we read in the Old Testament the presence of God, that's what it's talking about, a close and personal encounter with the Lord. And Moses, he, he was a man who, who sought God, didn't he? And so we're going to pick this story up in a second, but here's a really quick overview. Is that okay? Instead of reading the whole book, I thought maybe I'll condense it for you. So yes, I won't pick up every single thing, but bear with me. Go home and do your homework. So Moses has a conversation with God on Mount Sinai. And at this point, it's... It's sort of three months after they've been delivered um, out of Egypt. And so for how many years? Can anyone tell me? How many years were they enslaved, the Israelites? 500. No, 2000. Very good. So about 400. You're both close. You both get a medal. Very good. So a huge, I think there was over a million were um, delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians. And so they were set free. And so God goes up to... Um, God meets Moses up at the top of the hill and this is where he gives them the Ten Commandments, the laws, you know, because basically what's happened is they've come out of slavery. So God's saying, hey, here's a new way of living 
because you've been enslaved, I'm going to help you transition uh, back into what I want you to live like and this is how I want you to behave, this is how I want you to treat each other uh, and this is how I want you to worship me. So don't have any other gods. And so God gave them structure and a new way to live. And all the structure people say, amen. Amen. Um, And then we sort of see there's a few different things here, but basically the Israelites, they're they're down the bottom of the mountain with Aaron and they're waiting for Moses. He's up on the hill. He's spending some time with God, but he's taking his sweet time. Does anybody know what they do during that moment while they're waiting? Mind-blowing. So three months prior, God's delivered them miraculously out of slavery Three months later, they've forgotten how good God is and they build a flipping golden statue to another God because they're like, we don't know where what's happening with Moses. Where is he? They've forgotten, mind-blowing, how amazing God is. And so God, yep, he gets a bit cross and he basically says to Moses, mate, control your people. No, he doesn't say that. That's what I would say. (laughs) But he says, what the heck? Like your people, they don't even remember. And so he sends a plague and he says, basically, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm considering wiping them out. We're going to pick the story up here together. And thanks to the boys up there on the presenter. (laughs) If you could pop that up, that'd be amazing. (laughs) And I'm going to read from the Living Bible this morning. And it says this, Exodus 33 The Lord said to Moses, lead these people you brought from Egypt to the land I promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. For I said, I will give this land to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not travel among you for you are stubborn unruly and I will be tempted to destroy you along the way (laughs) wow great words so God is saying I'm I'm a bit disappointed I am however I am I am going to send you into the promised land because that's what I said I was going to do but I'm not going to send my presence with you and so Moses is interceding for his people here God says, yeah, okay, I won't wipe them out, but I'll I'll continue to, I'll fulfill my part of the deal and I'll send you into the promised land. The promised land was, you know, guaranteed victory. I'll give you guaranteed victory. I'll give you all the sourdough you can eat. I'll give you all the honey that you can eat. I'll give you all the whole fat milk you can eat and drink. And, but I won't go with you. But I won't go with you. And so I'm moved at this point for Moses. You know, he has a decision to make here. Does he take his people into the promised land that's been prophesied many, many moons ago, the inheritance after 400 years of slavery, you know, rest, fruitfulness, all the good stuff? Does he take the people into the promised land without the presence of God? Or does he stay in the wilderness with the presence of God? What a great thought. I read that and went, get out of town. I have never read that like that before. Do we, do we go to the promised land without the Holy Spirit? Or do we stay in the wilderness with the Holy Spirit? Have a think about that for a second. Have you ever pursued a good idea without the presence of God. I'll lead the way. Yes, 100%. It doesn't end well. Have you ever pursued something without the peace of God? Yeah. You know, have you ever pursued the benefits of God, but not God himself? Maybe you've sought a dream or a vision, but forgotten, forgotten about the one that holds that. The thing that I love about Moses 
is that he sought God's face, not God's hand. We're going to read on. We're going to pick it up. Verse 12. We're going to see Moses' response here. I lied. I think I'm going to move it to verse 15. For Moses had said, if, you're going, if you aren't going with us, don't let us move a step from this place. If you don't go with us, who will ever know that I and my people have found favour with you and that we are different from any other people upon the face of the earth? And the Lord replied to Moses, Yes, I will do what you have asked, for you have certainly found favour with me and you are my friend. I love that Moses in this moment, he didn't wrestle with that thought. That dilemma, oh, do I head into the promised land without God or do I stay here with God? He didn't wrestle with that. He says, if you're not going with us, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not moving from here. You see, Moses had a core value for the presence of God. As we read, because of his core value, that determined his decisions. And his decision was what? I'm not going there without you, God. You see, the promised land offered victory, success, the resources, the good stuff. But Moses didn't want that stuff. He wanted God himself. So if it meant foregoing the promised land... Yet knowing God, then he knew what he, would to, he was to do. He knew what decision he must make. Moses was a man in pursuit of the presence of God. Not the promised land. Not what he could get. What he could get. And he would, he would give up the promised land. Because it's not what he valued most. He valued the presence of God. As a church, we want to be people that value the presence of God. We don't want to seek the promised land as a church without the presence of God. And the church that we believe we are to be as people that value the presence of God. We can go down all these different rabbit warrens and all these different paths, but actually where we stand firm is, hey, we value the presence of God. We don't want all the benefits of God without God himself. I just had this weird thought come into my brain. Look out. It's like putting on a big, massive birthday party. All the balloons, you've got a big photo backdrop thing. I don't know, I don't really do parties, but like all the stuff. You've got decorations, you've invited hundreds of people, but you forgot to invite the birthday person. <laughs> That's what church is like without the presence of God. That ended well, didn't it? That was scary. Woo! <laughs> we don't ever want to put on this big hoo-ha this big thing, and forget to invite the guest of honour. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be people like that. One of my go-to verses when I'm, you know, reading and thinking is Matthew 6.33 because it, it helps me to reset my priority. And it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously and he will give you everything you need. You know, as a, as a core value, this really helps us to prioritise God above all else, it says. You know, someone else that, that talks a lot around this is David. He's a cool guy. But he, he says this in Psalm 27. He's not a perfect guy. He's very real. He's very relatable. But he says this in Psalm 27. Seven four. The one thing, I'm totally going to read that. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. 
And, you know, I went and I looked up, what does that actually mean, the house of the Lord? And it simply just speaks of where the presence was. It wasn't necessarily a building. It actually just talked about wherever the presence of God was, that's where he wanted to be. And that was the one thing it says that he sought. That's the one thing he desired. Gosh, imagine if we were people that, that sought after God like that. Above all else, pursuing the presence of God. You know, one thing we've been wrestling with post-COVID is how we define success as a church. Pastors, how do we define success? And, you know, previously we've measured things by numbers, haven't we? And it's been, you know, how many people have attended? How many people go to connect groups? How many people are there on Sunday? How much tithe do we take home? How many people are we reaching through community engagement? And there's all these numbers and things. And so that's actually not bad. It's not bad at all. It's actually really helpful. But it's not the thing we seek, is it? You know, I'd love to see our church grow. I'd love to see our connect groups grow. I would love to see our impact grow. But I would not want to see all of that happen without God being on it. We are are in pursuit of one thing, church. The presence of God. And as we read, you know, all these things will be added when we seek God first. All these things will be added. We don't have to worry about adding. God adds. What a weight off. It's brilliant. So we are establishing a culture. We're building a culture here of the presence of God. The presence of God, a close and personal encounter with the Lord. And I love, Libby, how you led this morning because you just were like, nah, handbrake the uh, run sheet. Who needs prayer for healing? And I was like, yes, yes. So Moses and David, look, they define success by the presence of God. Moses, I'm not going to the promised land without the presence of God. I'd rather stay over here in the wilderness with the presence of God. And, you know, Exodus 33, 16, you know, part of what we read, it's around like the presence of God was what distinguished the Israelites from all the other nations. It was the thing that set them apart. What separates the church from every other club or group in our community? presence of God that wasn't a trick question (laughs) if the presence of God is not upon our church then what distinguishes us without the presence of God we're just like CrossFit I love CrossFit. I mean, I wish I loved CrossFit. (laughs) My sister's really into it, okay? She's really, she's looking great. I wish I was into it, honestly, but I'm not. Bless her. Oh, what? (laughs) Croissant. (laughs) But, (laughs) Ali, I love you. (laughs) But if, if you come here and you don't experience the presence of God... That's not meaningful. If we secure the promised land without the presence of God, that's not meaningful. That's not success. That's not fruitful. It's just works. It's self-seeking and it's, it's gross. And I wouldn't give my life to that, actually. The presence of God is what we need and it's all we have to offer. The Israelites knew that. Moses knew that. A program won't change someone's life. The presence of God changes someone's life. 
the lights and the sound and the chairs and the, the things, they're great and they're helpful, but they are not enough to change someone's life. Great events aren't enough to change someone's life. Maybe temporarily, all that, that sort of feeling of change, but nothing long term. Heck, even a great sermon can't change your life unless God is on that. And I was having this convo with Garth before, like, I don't want to play church. Like, I want this to count. I want my children to, to know the presence of God. As we are building a culture of pursuing one thing, that is the presence of God. We know that in the presence of God, something can change. Someone can change. We're not trying to be the biggest church in Wagga. We're not trying to be the best op shop in Wagga. We're not trying to be the best youth ministry in Wagga. We're just trying to be people that are obedient and pursue God. And we're quite comfortable in that. We're quite secure in that. We're people that pursue the presence of God in our gatherings. We're people that pursue the presence of God in our all-in spaces, in our outreaches, in our go weeks, in our connect groups, in our conversations, in our relationships, in kids' church. Why not? In second half, in our worship, in our preachers, in our encounter nights. But also, we're people that pursue the presence of God on a Monday morning and on a Tuesday afternoon and a Wednesday when I want to smack my children and (laughs) Thursday when I'm a bit tired and Friday when I'm like, God, where are you? I pursue you, God, over everything else. Because we need God himself. We don't need the the promises of God. We don't need the things of God. We need God himself first. Otherwise, we become religious. We need God to turn up himself. How are we going? Oh, we're, we're doing good. You know, we've got some stuff going down in our family at the moment and it's not great. But do you know what I'm amazed at? How God would move in that situation. You know, we've got a brother-in-law who loves to poke fun at us because we're Christians. He loves it. He brings it up often, doesn't he? He's just like, he's a goose. <laughs> but we love him. And, you know, he called me this week and he said, Tasha, I need you to pray for me. Yeah. Yesterday he called me and he said, I need you to pray for me. I said, sorry, is that you? <laughs> you could imagine it. And he said, I don't have hope and I know you do. And I'm like, get out of town. I'm just going to pop this on record for later. No, 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 I didn't do that. And I said, look, I don't have much to say, but I I can pray because I said, all I've got is Jesus. He's like, yep. And so I prayed with him very quickly because I know that people are longing for that. He doesn't want what I have to say because sometimes he doesn't even like me (laughs) and that's okay. But, yeah, he's seeking. He's longing for God. And I think we're in the greatest time that we've ever seen. A box here because we met her down at Wilga Street. We loved her. And we, yeah, we love you and your kids. And, you know, we, we handed out sausages and we handed out coffees. But it's not about that. It's not about that. It is a means because our core value is the presence of God. So we're going to take that presence of God wherever we go. 
Am I going to build relationships and meaningful connections? And I love that a Bok Rock, I don't even text her anymore. To, I don't even hustle her to come anymore. She just comes. She's not coming for me. She's coming for God. Guys, this is the greatest time. When we value the presence of God, he changes people, not us. We have the privilege of walking with people. We have the privilege of walking with you guys because we all have the presence of God. And when we come together, how powerful that you get to encourage the person next to you. When you're not feeling great, we get to encourage each other because we all carry the presence of God. And I think what's happening is God is developing in us a passion for the presence of God. Personally and collectively. And, you know, I I had this thought too. Like, I really had to think about this. Like, am I hungry for the presence of God? Because it is a little bit messy. I like order. I like to have my ducks in a row. But am I hungry for the presence of God? Or am I peckish? Because sometimes we think peckish is actually hungry. Is hunger. But it's not So they tell me. It's not. (laughs) But when we develop a passion for the presence of God, we actually encounter the presence of God. So think about ways that you used to do that. I think Libby, Libby even shared that this morning. You know, think of a time when you, you know, encountered God. And so the more you connect with God, the more you're going to hunger after God. And I think as a church, when we stand on this core value, as we build this culture of the presence of God, people that come in are going to catch it. Because it's all we have to offer, right? The presence of God is all we have to offer. It's not three songs and a communion. It's God himself. You know, the spirit in which we encounter the presence of God is through humility. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Start with humility. If it's been a while, I know how that feels. But start with humility. Just a really simple prayer that you just even maybe write it down or something and just use that to connect with God. You know, one thing we value here is that we're authentic. We're not pretending. We're not putting on a show. We're certainly not perfect. We know that. But as we come to God in humility, the Bible says that he will exalt you. He doesn't leave you exposed and like out there. He he puts his arms around you. The Bible says that God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12. You know, for some of us, we need to really start to prioritise reading the word of God over other things, starting with and ending in ace book. (laughs) Get to know the power of God through the word of God. We learn so much about who he is. We learn so much about who we are in that. We learn what does the presence of God look like? What does it feel like? What's the fruit of the spirit? The other thing that I sort of am trying to do is is really just carve out times where I just pray, not with music in or anything like that, but just pray and be still and hear what God might want to say back to me. You know, I've been trying to walk around the lake without headphones in and without, you know, chatting to people. I really like to say hi to people. So, But just trying to walk around the lake and just actually not even, but like do an internal prayer, but just let God talk to me through what I see, what I observe. And it's quite amazing, you know, when you appreciate what God has made... He can talk to you in new and fresh ways. So find new ways if you need to encounter the presence of God. 
Find new ways. Be empowered to go and do that. Know that he'll meet you. He'll meet you there. You know, worship. I know, Brad, for you, worship's your thing. And it's like, you know, when you haven't encountered the presence of God for a while, maybe you need to crank that song up. That one song that you know is going to just kind of open the door of heaven for you. My poor kids, I've, I've like flogged one or two songs a week. Honestly, Luke can vouch for this. <laughs> I actually, I was doing it at church the other day and James, I think it was you, going, is this song on repeat? I was like, yes, it is, 100%. Because that's how I like kind of feel God. It's just one or two songs on repeat. Each to their own, find your own way. But it's like, I know, okay, I'm really struggling today. So instead of leaning into that, instead of leaning into, well, God says I should do this and this and this, like the benefits of God, I just lean into God. And I'd be real about that. God, I'm struggling to feel you today. Struggling to hear you, God. But as I make space for God, he'll always come through. As a church, when we prioritise the presence of God, he'll always come through for us. Let's not pursue the promised land without the presence of God. Let's not pursue the things of God without the presence of God. Let's not pursue the program or the event or the thing without the presence of God. Let's not pursue the hand of God over the face of God. I'd love it if you guys could stand. We are right on time. Just put that down in your notepad. (laughs) It's exciting. We're deliberately not going to play music right now because we can rely on the music to take us into the presence of God. We don't actually need that three-chord progression thing (laughs) to encounter the word, to encounter the person of Jesus. So our culture that we're building and establishing as a church is that when we value the presence of God, he would do what only he can do. When we value the presence of God, we get to take that with us outside of here, wherever we go, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our families, in our homes, in our streets, in our connect groups, in our kids' church, in our youth gatherings, in our Sundays, The presence of God is what transforms people. And what a privilege to carry the presence of God wherever we are. So we're going to pray together and you're going to use your words. And I just believe collectively as we just ask God to come and be with us. I think it's actually turning a corner as a church. I think we're going to step into more Holy Spirit-led meetings. We haven't nailed that in the past. But isn't that cool that we're not condemned for that? But we're invited to pursue the one thing. And so I'd love for you to just stand there wherever you are. You know, if it helps you to focus by putting your hands out or up or whatever, whatever floats your boat. Just in your own words, ask God to be with you. And then Garth's going to pray at the end. And if you're on Zoom, please join us as well.